and uh, director of the Fallon United States Center, which is um, hosting uh, tonight's event. So this round table that we've organized, come on in, um, uh, it grows out of a collaborative project um, on the future of global governance that the um, Fallon uh, U.S. Center and Georgetown School of Foreign Service um, launched uh, last uh, November. Um, and it, it brings together a group of um, distinguished, um, publicly engaged uh, scholars um, representing different parts of the world to try to take stock of the defining global uh, and regional challenges facing us and to consider what kinds of innovations at the level of policy and governing might be taken uh, to meet uh, these challenges. Um, and the project, I think, um, it, it emerged um, from a sense that, um, and my co-chair on the project is uh, Professor Charles Kupchin, and it grew out of a conversation that we were, we sense that uh, we're kind of witnessing a transition from the liberal order, um, certainly that took uh, uh, form uh, at the end of World War II. Um, and that we're in some kind of an interregnum, a transition. Some people on the, in our group refer to it as a, as a hinge point. On the one hand, we've got kind of rising geopolitical competition uh, and deepening uh, internal uh, divisions within the leading states. And that's making it harder to sustain that liberal order. On the other hand, existential challenges from climate to nuclear proliferation um, to global poverty really can't be addressed without international cooperation. And so there's a sense that there's a gap between the need for greater global cooperation going forward and the capacity and, in some cases, the willingness of governments to provide it. And so in light of these developments, it seemed important to us to broaden the conversation, bring to the table voices from different regions of the world. Um, and so joining me tonight are uh, several uh, members of the, of the study group. We're a study group consisting of, of 10 members from literally across the world. And, um, and, and they include, uh, Charlie Kupchen from uh, Georgetown, um, Georgetown University and the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, and to his right, um, Dr. Uh, Selena Ho, who is um, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. And to her right, um, Dr. C. Uh, um, Raja Mohan from the Asia Society Policy Institute in Delhi. And um, to his right, Professor Cornelia Wall, President and Professor of International Political Economy uh, at the Hurdy School. So welcome to all of you. It's great to have you here. Um, before we get started, let me just also mention there's plenty of time here for questions from the audience and also from the online audience. So when we get to that stage, I just ask you to raise your hand and an usher will come to you uh, after I... Um, you know, uh, identify you, but it would be great if you also identify yourself, um, who you are, your name, and, and your affiliation. And for those of you online uh, with us this evening, it would be great also when you, if you put a question into the Q&A function, that you also include your, um, your name and, and your affiliation. So with that, um, please join me in giving uh, our panelists a warm LSE welcome. And so in the setup to this panel, I, I decided what I would do is ask each of the panelists one question um, and give them a few minutes, each of them, um, you know, four to five minutes to um, share um, some initial reflections. And the question has to do with, you know, what do they take to be the defining global challenge or challenges 
um, facing us in the coming years. Um, so that's the question. Charlie, it's great to have you back at LSE. Um, so from your perch, when you think about this, what stands out as the big challenge? What's, where's the, maybe the, the greatest source of risk going forward? Um, I'm going to point to two interrelated challenges uh, because they, they are the ones that I would say cause uh, me the most insomnia uh, and worry. Um, and you, you'll see in a minute why they're intertangled, inter, interwoven. The first is the prospects for the revival of the durability, stability, ideological moderation of, of the liberal democratic West. Uh, and I, I worry a lot about what's happening in the United States, what the next election will bring. I worry about what's happening on this side of the Atlantic. We have certainly seen the pendulum swing back from the worst of what I would call the illiberal populist wave. Uh, Biden did win the election. In this country, the prime minister seems to be on a, on a more even keel. The center has held in Germany. Macron was reelected. Uh, but I don't think we can say that we are out of the woods. Uh, and I say that in, in part because we have lots of different data points out there, including the recent election in Germany, that have suggested the pendulum is swinging back in the direction of illiberal <coughs> populism. But I also say it because I think one of the sources of this problem is the digital revolution, the automa automation of our, in, uh, our uh, economies, social media, AI, and this stuff is going to pick up. It's not going to abate. And so this fundamental question of how working Americans, working Britons, working Germans are going to put bread on the table, it, to me, is really a, a, a very pressing question. Because we've got to solve that problem if we're going to get our liberal democratic societies back up on their feet. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll prompt Cornelia with this, but you know, Germany really is the one country that has hung in there. The center has held. Social Democrats and Christian Democrats are still centrist mainstream parties. For the most part, these opponents in German politics treat each other respectfully. Uh, is that going to last as you begin to deal with the problems of declining uh, trade in China? Uh, you're behind the curve in terms of the digital transformation. Um, so I don't know where, where Germany is, but if you guys go the same way some of the rest of us have gone, we in a heap of trouble. That brings me to the second, the second challenge, and that is that I think we are at a historical inflection point, moving toward a world that will, the, for the first time in history, be one of globalized multipolarity. We've been in multipolar worlds before, but they were not globalized. We've been in globalized worlds before, but they were run either from London or Washington. We're now headed into a globalized world in which there will not be a captain at the helm. And it's not just because U.S. and China are going head to head, it's because many emerging economies are going to be charting their own course. India is, is likely to have the world's second largest economy within a couple of decades. The Indians, my best guess, Raja, you'll say more about this, aren't going to tuck in to the Western world. They're not going to tuck into the Sinocentric world. They're going to follow their own interests. And so the question for me is, how are we going to preserve stability and tackle the big transnational problems of the day in a world of globalized multipolarity? That brings the West 
needs to get its house in order to help mediate, broker, manage the transition to a globalized, multipolar world in a way that prevents what I think will be the default alternative, and that is the onset of global disarray. Put a lot on the table there, um, and I think we're going to want to circle back. Um, Selena, you've written a lot about Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia's connections to India, to China. How do things look from there? Globalized, multipolarity? Yeah, so, um, well, so I actually group my answers uh, into three big baskets. And multipolarity versus bipolarity is one of the Great. key things. Um, so I would say that what we are seeing right now, um, and I think it's largely true, is that uh, we are looking at an unstable bipolarity that's happening. Um, but Charlie is also right to point to multipolarity. So uh, the question is, when we look at the world order, are we transiting to a multipolarity, right? So there are ideas that are emerging from the rest when they look at what's happening between the United States and China, mm -hmm. um, you know, that they are not able to provide the kind of leadership that the world needs right now. Um, the rest are asking, you know, uh, maybe ideas have to come from us. Um, and, um, and middle powers, you see middle powers taking up some of the slack, whether it's about um, things like global supply chain, creating new rules and standards for digital trade, reforming the multilateral trading system in the WTO. Um, in other words, the, you are actually looking at um, that the rivalry between the US and China is galvanizing the, galvanizing the rest to do something about it. So the question is, how will the new world order, uh, when we look at the order transition that's happening, uh, how is it going to be able to accommodate the aspirations of the rest? This, this desire for multipolarity is actually a, a a, a need for the rest to have a voice mm -hmm. in the new order or the uh, reform order or the tran order transition that we are come, uh, we are looking at. So in Southeast Asia, where I come from, uh, this rhetoric of a multipolar world order is very strong. Our uh, our government officials, our former government officials, they speak as if we are already in a multipolar world order. And, um, and, and for the region, the focus is on ASEAN, ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Studies, uh, to provide leadership where the US and China, when China have, have failed. Um, now, this, this brings me to my next point, which is um, what is the impact of this intense rivalry on international institutions? We are seeing paralysis in the UNSC, you know, WHO, WTO, and we know that reforms are needed. But uh, where it, these institutions are weak, where is the leadership coming from? We are looking at a leadership vacuum. Uh, the United States is in, a, um, you know, with Trump, the damage that's been done to its leadership. We, we see Joe Biden coming in, turn, trying to restore it. But we were discussing just now, 2024 presidential election, it's, it's uncertain how things are going to pan out. Um, and the feeling in the region is that the U.S. is actually a very a wounded nation, uh, you know, full of ideological divisions, uh, politically disunited. It's a fragmented society. So, you know, its ability to lead, even if it's willing to lead, is actually being called into question by the rest. Um, and then on the other side, you're, you're looking at uh, China exercising global leadership, but it's not trusted by the West. But the interesting thing is, and uh, you know, according to convention, uh, uh, against conventional wisdom, is also not trusted in the East. Uh, there are many polls that we actually conducted conducted in the region, and and this, uh, the sense is that China, you know, while it's being respected in many spheres, and 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 it's attractive because of the economic benefits that come with being uh, uh, drawing closer to China, it is still not trusted in the East. Uh, we can explore that in the Q&A. People want to know why. Now, um, and, and one of the key, one of, what, but for now, what I would say that why global leadership, uh, China's global leadership is not being trusted is because it does not present 
uh, one of the key points, uh, but not the only one, is that it does not present a vision of global order that is supported by uh, most countries. Um, and the other question that remains about China being able to exercise global leadership is the domestic politics of China. Uh, economic slowdown, power shortages, property market debt, high unemployment, these all have effects on domestic stability in China. So if a country is unstable uh, domestically, can it lead? So we're looking at a, video, a leadership vacuum at a time when IOs uh, actually need to be reformed to reflect the aspirations of the rest and then to take into account uh, new developments uh, in the world, uh, which is different from when the IOs were first formed. And we are also looking at the fragmentation of uh, domestic politics. This is the biggest, second big challenge. Uh, it used to be that I would say, by and large, foreign policy is insulated from domestic politics. But we know with the rise of nationalism, um, governments have become more sensitive mm -hmm. to public opinion. Now, this has several impact. It means that uh, foreign policy is no longer a realm that is strictly in, usually, uh, in the hands of governments, especially in Southeast Asia. Um, pub the public is able, to, through social media, you know, uh, be able to reflect their concerns even on issues that are related to foreign policy. These are not usually the issues they are concerned about. They're more concerned about bread and butter issues. Now, uh, what do governments do when they uh, have to deal with na rising nationalism? Some t in the past, we know they have constructed enemies uh, to, to unite or to distract. Now we worry about these things uh, in, in, in how domestic politics is affecting foreign policy. It's also impacting IOs. Distrust and skepticism of IOs have increased. Uh, and um, this is part of the deglobalization trend. But in a way, this deglobalization trend has not really impacted Southeast Asia. It's more, uh, you know, as we discussed in it just now, the, the impact is actually much more in the West. In the East, there is still support for globalization, but the question is, how do we go back to globalization? How do we strengthen the rules there? How do we strengthen the multilateral trading system? Now, the third greatest challenge, I think you point, out, uh, point to it just now a little bit, which is you know, climate change. These are old problems, but we still haven't gotten ahead of the curve so for so many decades already when it comes to climate change. But then, while these old problems continue, we still have all these new problems that are coming, and we haven't, uh, you know, we are not able to catch up. Uh, things that are related to future pandemics, uh, governance of new technologies, we need those rules for AI, for biotechnology. Universities need to get ahead of ChatGPT, you know, and all the other uh, AI tools. So uh, now IOs and global governance are not ready to deal with this this kind of new threats, our ability to cope is really falling far behind. Um, so in sum, these three big groups of uh, uh, what is the world order going to be, what uh, the impact of uh, domestic politics on foreign policy, on IOs, and then the management of these new emerging uh, developments in our, in our society and our economy that we're not able to get ahead of. They're all intertwined, they compound each other, and Charlie is right, we are an inflection point where everything seems to be coming together. I don't want to use the word perfect storm because that mm -hmm. has a lot of other implications, but we are really seeing a whole host of problems coming in together at the same time. A wounded nation. <laughs> China's not trusted. Sounds like an opening for India. Um, I, but, <laughs> Raja, you write a lot about geopolitics and... and um, we, what does it look like to you when you're, you know, kind of parsing the world from, from India? Okay, I'll just say three things. I mean, uh, one, uh, from Delhi at least, uh, the talk about uh, the decline of the West uh, seems premature. Uh, it's been a story that's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. When was uh, Spengler's Decline of the West? <laughs> it was published in 1901. Uh, so, so you have actually a lot of people worried about the decline of the West, a lot of people, uh, you know, hopeful about the decline of the West. I mean, we've seen many waves of this, and I think uh, even in the last few years, we've seen the resilience of the United States. I don't think it's a, it has huge domestic political problems, but 
in terms of its impact on the world, its capacity to bring in new technologies, uh, continues to surprise us. Uh, so so I, I would say don't write off the Americans yet. Uh, so I would say they even in the last two years, they've rallied around the West mm. uh, that on the Ukraine question, uh, they've gathered the large alliance, they've strengthened the alliance, NATO has got more members, uh, and it is talking the big talk of simultaneously dealing with the Russian and the Chinese threats, both in Europe and in Asia. So I think it, the agenda is quite ambitious and not everyone is enamored, I think, about this, an alternative world order uh, that China and Russia are going to build. Mm. Uh, because the problem, as we've seen repeatedly, the challenges to the West have their own weaknesses. That a China that is at odds with its, all its neighbors, a Russia that tries to be expansionist without the economic resources, uh, or the international influence of the kind that the Soviet Union enjoyed. So I would say this challenge is not sustainable. Uh, even together, even if they, they talk about being together, even then it would not be uh, possible. And I think much of China's own growth came because of the access to the American market. Mm -hmm. These Chinese uh, new technologies have flourished because of American venture capital. It was really an alliance between Wall Street and China that produced the Chinese growth. Uh, so I think the, the system, I think, is trying to squeeze that out. Uh, there will be battles. But my sense is this idea that China and Russia can build an alternative world order uh, away from the U.S. and the West, uh, I think uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be happening because uh, China has created contradictions with Japan, with all its neighbors, with India, with Vietnam. So this kind of uh, un, not really targeting any particular ideology, but a communist state, a democratic state, a Confucian state, you can name whatever you want. I think the idea that there is an East or a South as a lump is fundamentally wrong. Mm. When Xi Jinping says Asia for Asians, I don't think the Japanese who actually invented the idea long ago, yeah. uh, when they were being imperial, mm. that they would simply accept uh, a China-led Asia. Uh, India is not going to accept a China-led Asia. I mean, there's nothing to do with whether we like China or not. It's a very structure of politics out there that Asia is still nationalist. Uh, those who think Asia has given up its nationalism uh, is, is completely wrong. So, so I think there will be pushback. And I think this way the U.S. has played its cards well. Uh, unlike in the past where the U.S. tried to do everything itself, that it was the center, it was the hub, and everybody else was a spoke. Today, I think the U.S. policy is talking about getting the spokes together. Uh, expanding its alliance structure, building new coalitions like the Quad, like the AUKUS. Uh, so I think they're creating a whole network of new coalitions, new alliances, which is the weakness of China and Russia. They don't have too many allies. And I think that's where the problem for, the, for China and Russia is going to be. The fact that they mobilized the third largest economy to double its defense spending, that is Japan. They got the Germans, the fourth largest economy, to promise to build up against Russia, and they got the fifth largest economy, India, uh, to do and supporting it uh, to, to build a coalition against China. So, so I, I would say it's entered a very interesting phase. Uh, the trick for the West would be that it's not merely saying, look, we're in charge, guys, India, will you come and join us against China and Russia? But it must be, how are you going to accommodate India, Japan, and others into a new hierarchy? That is the challenge, and I think uh, there's far more openness today. They're merely saying, look, the order is set. Guys, you stand in the queue. We like you, so you just support us. To one way, the rearrangement of the hierarchy within the West has to change. Why is Canada part of G7? Uh, Italy. I mean, if you keep saying, look, this structure is permanent, everything else is temporary, I, th I think you've got to accommodate others in. That's where I think uh, I would say the Biden administration strategy has given hints of it. Uh, so I think there is a lot of new possibilities. I would say, for those of us students here, look out for a structural change that is going on. Uh, don't simply go by, it is a question of the Western decline or rise of China. There is a much more complicated world in which the West probably is looking for ways to accommodate other rising powers that I think will produce very interesting outcomes in the years ahead. That's very interesting, sir. The, 
the system has more legs than it than it might first appear, and so I'd, I'd like to hear more about that. I think maybe what would be good is, Cornelia, you come at problems from a kind of IPE perspective, uh, you know, um, not geopolitics. I don't know, does the system look robust? Thank you. I did bring a, an economics uh, case, the question, what are the most pressing global challenges? Because, um, and I will start very much at the um, high level and then go back down to the, to the ground. But I do think that uh, one of the most urgent challenges we need to address is the international financial and monetary architecture. And um, I'm not the only one to say this. There's a summit uh, no later than the 23rd of June in Paris um, called together by Emmanuel Macron. So this is a challenge that's currently on everybody's uh, plate. But uh, the calls of why this is urgent have been made um, very um, eloquently by um, Prime Minister of Barbados, uh, Barbados Motley. Um, we have stress on um, the financial situation of a lot of countries that are um, for reasons external to them, and we need to redesign the institutions we have to provide financial solidarity. So one example that has, of course, been discussed a lot is climate change. The exposure of countries uh, and the vulnerabilities they have um, are something that is something that needs to be addressed, and that's the discussion of loss and damages that come out of the climate negotiations. We have vulnerabilities, again, external, that we have um, experienced through the um, pandemic exposure to crises such as a public health crisis, but also exposure to the effects of war that we now see with Ukraine as the breadbasket of really putting the question of food security back up on uh, everybody's consciousness. And how do you help those that are struggling in moments where you do need um, elements of financial solidarity? We have a system in place, and that is the Bretton Woods system designed as a response to World War um, II, but it's dominated by the West, if you will, it is the product of US hegemony. And in a way, we need to rethink these institutions in the globalized multipolar world that we've already um, spoken about. And reforming these institutions has been on the table, IMF quotas, for example, for at least 20 years. But it is deadlocked to a certain degree. Um, Europe is not particularly interested. The US is opposed to it, arguing, I think, quite rightly that a vote would never pass uh, the House to say we need to redesign our international organizations. A lot of people in the US also don't like international organizations in order to make more room for China. Now you have two things that nobody will like. So it's very difficult for domestic politics reasons to reform these institutions. But as a result, what we see is now, even in the architecture of our financial solidarity, a parallel world that has developed which is a system where China has risen unilaterally as an alternative lender of last resort. And if you just look at the numbers, you see quite clearly that the size of it is, is just very impressive um, or very disconcerting depending on where you stand. The People's Bank of China provides a global swap line with today over 40 central banks. This has just risen from 2008 to today, providing over 107 billion US dollars in liquidity support to countries that are struggling. This is a paper uh, published by the Kiel Institute by Juan um, Parks, Reinhardt, and Trebisch, who've tried to put numbers on this second or parallel system as a lender of last resort. Chinese state-owned companies provided 70 billion US dollars in loans to, um, this is sovereign debt lending, to countries that are struggling. So if you just put these numbers together, you get 20% of the total IMF lending. And this is a system that is entirely separate. So on the one hand, one could say, well, that's good, more choice, more options. In a way, if there's more money to go around, uh, that's wonderful. And this, of course, comes on top of the 800 billion that China is also given in loans for infrastructure projects that um, um, I think you all are probably aware of, about as the Belt and Road Initiative. So there's a lot of money flowing into infrastructure and flowing into um, now sovereign debt aid coming from China. But the challenge is that in this parallel world, we have separate zones of influence and not just separate zones of influence because, of course, Chinese effort is linked to the Belt and Road Initiative and the IMF and the World Bank are 
Western dominated institution, so I don't want to talk away the, the power politics behind it, but it is also very quickly a challenge to the way in which you can provide development assistance and support through debt restructuring, which is one of the very important elements <coughs> with which um, we collectively or multilaterally try to help those countries that are struggling. And today there is a big spat, this is one of the elements of the difficult US-China relations on how to do this. Um, and uh, the US, I think, would argue that the IMF and the World Bank have turned towards debt forgiveness as one policy to support countries who are struggling in order to not make uh, sure that this difficulty spreads from one country to another and creates all the um, uh, difficulties we know that are part of it and uh, accuse China of being more stringent, more opaque, uh, not being as forgiving. And this is currently concerning a lot of countries that either have defaulted or are on the brisk of defaulting. We have Zambia, Sri Lanka, um, uh, Ethiopia, Pakistan to cite just one. So this is truly a global issue that we need to get our head around. And um, and it is also, if you if you like game theory, it's a very um, very dangerous game to play because currently the question is, well, if you need to restructure and help a country that's struggling for reasons that might be external, um, and you want to do it with debt forgiveness, but you have two ter parallel systems, does that mean the IMF does debt forgiveness, writes down their loans, and the money is going to go to China, which is in this case not doing the same thing. Well, in this case, absolutely nobody would vote for it, even in Europe. If it's the other way around, you have the same thing. Are we just repaying these two parallel pockets? It's just something that will not work. So we need to agree on a rules-based system, even for providing financial solidarity. That's even not what we have in the current architecture, um, because you, if you follow this, you know that um, debt forgiveness is something that's generally negotiated by, if it's a, a Paris club, a club of Rome, if it is private lenders. So it's negotiations which are very discretionary, since uh, discretionary always means full of power relationships. Um, if we now have a separate set of negotiations with China, we will get a lot of things that are going to be very hard to resolve. So I would make a plea for a rules-based system to deal with financial solidarity that is a bit more transparent and easier to um, see through for the countries who might be in financial distress. And I think this is also part of the way with which we need to address uh, vulnerabilities that come from some of the recent crises that we've seen. Now, I've picked this as a big challenge to uh, deal with. It's an economic challenge, but it's because, and I'll stick my head out here, because I believe that the uh, economy is at the root of a lot of other difficulties that we also um, know that we have to pay attention to. It's at the root of challenges to social cohesion. It's at the root of state capacity. It's at the root of ultimately um, the turn to violence. So I would say we have to fix um, the um, international financial si system in, in, as a way to address some of the other questions that are also very much on my mind. I will stop here, but I would like to respond just to Charlie's provocation because it's one of my favorite questions. So thank you for asking uh, me. And, and I agree with you. Of course, part of the global conversation is are some of these countries getting their house in order? Are we getting our own um, domestic politics in order? And here we have the, the move towards illiberal democracy authoritarian systems that we're all very concerned about. And I've always asked myself, why has Germany fared so well? This is a moment where I'm sitting back and I'm quite proud. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I'll make, it, I'll make it simple as an argument. Um, I mean, I think for historical reasons that uh, nobody will doubt the entire German constitution was designed to avoid that any one party winning an election can run away with the country and do whatever. So the entire institutional setup is uh, towards building consensus and blocking whoever wins the election. So democracy is not just winning an election. It is also protecting minority rights and protecting them forever. And so my, when I asked myself this question, my argument was, well, political institutions matter. They matter in countries that have consensus-based systems, the consociational systems. You have the Netherlands, you have the Swiss, Swiss directorate, I think it's called, where you always have several parties that need to rule together. And that makes a difference. And I asked the question to Daniel Zieblatt, the author of um, 
how democracies die. And he added, and I'd like to cite it because I think it's important, political parties matter as well because political parties are the, the part that puts the institutions into life at the different levels of action down to the very local level. So he has a lot more to say about what party cohesion and party um, strength actually means. And I think uh, that's important, but I'd like to mention it because it comes at a cost. So I'm quite proud of Germany, but the cost of this institutional setup is you can just not get things done. Germany was very um, much uh, listed as the eternal reformstau is the word. So always blocked reforms. Nothing ever got decided upon. Eternal bickering of the new uh, coalition government, incapacity, slowness, you name it, because it's very hard to actually put politics into action. So if you like a government that does things. If you like a government, and here I come to geopolitics, that develops a strategy, Germany is not the country to go to. And I do think in the current world we also need strategy. So that's the balance we need to find, and it's another time. Well, it sounds like Germany is not leading on the, in, 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 in this effort. Charlie, I see you scribbling down. Um, there's so many interesting threads here, but I, I, I sense that you and Raja have a, like a different take on the geopolitical structure. You see it as, um, and I think Selena is maybe closer to you, uh, that multiple blocks and that there's, that the global south is going to constitute a block. Um, and Raja, you do not, I mean, you didn't say it, but um, it seems like that <coughs> the implication. And I don't know, Cornelia, whether you think things would be better if it was a block in terms of reforming Bretton Woods institutions and so forth. But can we talk a little bit about this? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just respond to you and, and our colleagues with three quick comments. One is to agree with you, Cornelia, that, the, that Germany's blessing is its curse, right? One of the reasons that the center has held is the same reason that it may make it very difficult for Germany to do what it needs to do to fix domestic problems. Because those, you know, Germany has done pretty well because of the Mittelstand and it hasn't been deindustrialized in the same way the US has, but it, it's coming. And so reform is needed and, and I agree with your analysis. Two other broad comments, one is, I think Selena made the comment that that Russia and China uh, are, they're not putting on offer something. They're saying what they don't want. Yeah. And I agree with that. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, you know, we need to take down the liberal order. We need to end the era of Western domination. But they're not then saying, and here's our alternative. Uh, and until we're in a in a world in which there is a conversation uh, that takes the form of, okay, so you don't like this, what are you proposing? I think we're, we're not in a good space. Uh, and we're not in a good space in part because this debate isn't happening for ideological as well as political reasons. Uh, you have very strong strains of nationalism in Washington and Beijing that make it almost impossible to say, well, let, let's sit down and kind of figure out what uh, um, a pluralistic, polycentric world would look like. You know, you say that in Washington today and you're going to get run out of town if you're a politician. Um, but that seems to me to be a debate we should be having, but we're not having. The final comment, and this brings me to where I think Raja and I part ways. I saw, I think your analysis is correct today. I don't think it will be correct tomorrow. And that's because, yes, if you add the US and Japan and Germany and Italy, uh, you get the lot, you know, probably somewhere close to uh, the majority of global GDP. But we are now in a world in which power is decidedly shifting from west to east and north to south. And as a consequence, even if the west gets its house in order, in 2050, the world is going to look a lot different than it does today. And I think we have to look over the horizon 
and, and figure out what that world is going to look like. And I don't think there will be a, 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 a global south bloc. I think there will be uh, multipolarity, a kind of a, a west of sorts, yeah. uh, um, an, a sinocentric system of sorts, and then a mess. <laughs> because I think that's a pole. Well, non, <laughs> no, non-alignment doesn't doesn't necessarily tell you, you know, that you're going to group together around non-alignment, right? It simply says, well, I'm not going to choose A or B. Yeah. I'm going to choose C, right? And so India is going to choose multi-alignment or whatever you choose, and Brazil is going to choose something else. And I really think you're going to see a kind of mm. centrifugal force creating uh, disorder. We have time here. Roger, you want to weigh in on this and then others? Yeah, I mean, I would say, look, uh, yeah, today there is actually a coalition that the U.S. has built is pretty strong. Right. But I can imagine a coalition where the U.S. aligns with a large part of the East, that's India City, for example, that the East is divided, uh, that a U.S. that works, I mean, the Europeans might not like it, but a U.S. that works closely with the rising powers of the East, at least, say, India, Japan, then it can alter the balance, that it doesn't have to be West in a current definition, a geographic West versus a geographic East, but a U.S. that is in coalition with India and Japan alters this whole framework in which we are debating this. And I think that's why Japan's transformation in the last one year is not really reported or studied as much. That here is a country that was unwilling to do a lot of things, happy to let the Americans do everything, to one of actually talking about a counter-strike capability, uh, build, buying 500,000 uh, new missile arsenal, uh, assisting other countries. So they're finally breaking out of the 45 mode and willing to help other countries in that part. That's one. Second, on the technological side, you just have to see Indians in Silicon Valley. Uh, every Indian engineer thinks he has a right to be in, in the United States, because most of them seem to get there. Uh, but the fact is that you can build this cross-cutting coalitions, which provide a new template in which you think of power distribution. So when today the US in Japan and talk about resilient supply chains. They're saying decenter from China, work with India, Japan, Australia, try to build a counter chain because uh, so-called trusted geographies, the idea of trusted friends. So the framework in which globalization took place, in which China rose, you're already thinking of an alternate. Whether you'll succeed or not, we could, we could argue that. Second, I think the global south, just as the east is not united, Look, just we didn't get rid of the Western imperialism for 400 years just to merely accept Chinese hegemony. Come on. <laughs> that, uh, we are all nationalists in Asia, even Cambodia, uh -huh. even Laos, which is so close to China. They're not going to simply cede their sovereignty because China has risen. The problem has been the West has not paid attention. For 30 years, you gave us lectures. You knew best, you knew answers. But I think what we've seen in the last two years is U.S. is now engaging, re-engaging large parts. Mm. And I think that's the beginning of a change. You pay attention, you get interesting results. Uh, that's where you see in the last one year, as I said, Japan has changed, Korea has moved, Philippines is changing, India has moved. I mean, India was non-aligned, but today it's one of the, it's never been as close to the U.S. as it is today. Mm. So I think a West that pays attention to traditional statecraft, of traditional geopolitics, mm will find friends. And I can tell you, many in the global south are quite happy to leverage the confrontation between US and China. If I've got cobalt, lots of it, I know the Chinese want it, I know the Americans want it. Mm -hmm. Do your friends would like them too? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> we do. Uh, the thing is to them, there is leverage actually for us. So this is not, we are frightened by this, you know, unipolar world. Actually, we see a US-China competition opens up unlimited possibilities, whether you're in Central Africa, whether it's in Southeast Asia, whether you're in Pacific Islands. So I think, as you, morning you were saying, great power competition produces a discipline, but it also gives choices for us right. to leverage and to bargain with both the powers. Can I? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just quick, quick thoughts on, you know, each of my fellow speakers, uh, what they have said. Um, I think, you know, in, in terms of IPE and um, one of the greatest signs that the, that the U.S. is not in decline is actually the, the U.S. dollar. 
there is no alternative currency mm. to the U.S. dollar, right? I mean, the U.S. economy may be in trouble, but the U.S. dollar is still that uh, the, that that one that everyone goes to. Um, Roman being internationalization is not working out very well. Um, there are fears. Um, I mean, Southeast Asia has a lot of these swap arrangements with in terms of trade, mm. but then there are fears of that sanctions may be imposed on China at some point, and then what happens to the RMB and, and on trade, right? Uh, so that's one, one thing of the US dollar, uh, the strength of the US dollar is, is a key point, that uh, the decline of the US is, you know, is not something that, uh, that's happening right now. So in IP, absolutely zones of influence, different parts of uh, the economy is being dominated by different, different big powers. So again, the idea of multipolarity could be happening here. And then, um, um, I don't think that, uh, in response to what Charlie said, I don't think that China d wants to end the, d end the dominance of the West globally at the moment, primarily because they know it's, China's not ready. I don't think the, the leadership is, is irrational. They know that they don't have what it takes to end uh, global dominance of the West right now. Now, what they want globally is respect, respect from the United States mm -hmm. and the right, the existence of its own political system and to be treated as co-equals. Now, regionally, regionally in Asia, I believe China does want dominance. It does not want the U.S. to have mm -hmm. as much say, mm -hmm. or the West to come in. In fact, if they could, the U.S. get out, even better still, but you know that's not going to be uh, entirely possible because the U.S. is too much um, entrenched in the region already. But it would want to dilute U.S. dominance there. It wants to be dominant in, in, in Asia. But globally, I don't think uh, it's ready yet, and it knows it's not ready. I mean, there may come one day that it may be ready, and then it will do what it wants to do. Right? Um, that's one thing. And the other um, uh, thing that respond to Raja, you know, you mentioned India and all this configuration, but the, but the thing about, you know, India expect, U.S. expectations of India as another pole, as a counterweight to China, has always been disappointed, right? How, how is India going to be? They don't seem to be. I mean, they've just invited Mr. Modi for the yeah, state. Yeah, I know, case. but I, I know that. But the expectations, India doesn't seem to be look, I mean, picking up I, I just say, look back to 70s mm -hmm. when Americans made up with China. Mm -hmm. China was barely comparable to Russia at the time. Yeah. But a weak, internally divided China, right. seen just having China on your side made such a difference to Asia. Right. Because Sinjarian is 100 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, that you could do with a very weak state, but the damage China did to Russia. No, okay, so, so can, I'm, I'm not talking about whether uh, India is weak or not, but it's alignment. <laughs> it's not exactly aligning with the we United States. We don't have states. to, you know, we, you know, that's the point. Okay. The U.S. says okay. anyone who is even willing to oppose Chinese expansion is mm -hmm. good enough. I mean, they're not saying be like NATO, join us up. They're saying, look, India wants to quad, which is a non-military organization, fine, we'll go with it. So I think that's where I think the U.S. is showing flexibility, mm -hmm. which gives it room, actually, to bring together a much larger coalition, while the Chinese have a problem of beyond Russia, maybe Pakistan, a few others. I mean, they don't have too many allies who you can mobilize to deal with the onslaught of the, of the U.S. and its partners. Yeah, I, I do want to underscore, uh, underscore one of Roger's point, which is that Asia wants diversity. Exactly. It, it does not want one particular oh, set of values to dominate, a particular set of cultures to dominate. Um, I mean, if you think about, you know, some people say that Southeast Asia is part of, um, or at least Chinese Vietnam, is part of the uh, Confucian Sinocentric hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's not. If you think about the other alternative order, which is the Mandela order, the Mandela order thinks about all things, uh, you know, it's all co-equal, rulers are equal. There's no one sovereign, which is the case with the Confucian order, the Sinocentric Confucian order. And, and the fact that we are so ethnically diverse and there's a strong anti-Chinese sentiment in Southeast Asia is going to guard against the idea of a Sinocentric order. But it's also not one that will reject uh, China. It's just multiple influences. Confucianism, Islamism, Buddhism, Hinduism is all part of our history and our culture. And it will be the case, this, this value of diversity. 
Cornelia, any? <laughs> yes, I have one thought, and I think I'm, I'm trying, I will try to just provoke you. I, I don't believe <laughs> all of what I'm saying, but um, I'm not uh, at home in geopolitics, but I, I am, I am ticking when I hear predictions about alliances based on trust, trusting China or feeling that it makes sense mm -hmm. uh, to align because that sounds so nice. And I don't, I don't think that um, alliances uh, are, um, that you are as free to choose your alliance partners as that. I really think in economic terms, and, and this may sound very 1970s, but I do think in terms of systems, of domination that come close to possibly colonialism, maybe world systems theory, oh. whatever your reference is. And what matters in this world is how economically dependent you are on the country that is at the heart of the system. And what I think matters very much to me is the maps that you can see of the world where you have, I don't know, 1980s, 90s, 2000s, who is the most important trading partner. And if you look back in time, the US was just coloring the entire map in their color, whatever it was, let's say red. And if you look at it now, and you have China in blue next to it, and you see the countries whose most important trading partner today is China, the map has turned. And I think, I mean, it doesn't... It, it could turn again. It, maybe it will turn again, but maybe it also doesn't help you to get military expenditures up in the same way that you were just describing. Mm -hmm. So I do agree that that doesn't automatically mean people will align on all topics, but it does mean something about the division of powers and the way in which you can then utilize that system to exert power. What we see in um, in the, the geoeconomic world that we live in, a lot goes, yes, through the dollar, through the settlement systems, through the data flows, and they are used and weaponized in order to keep people in line. The, the French have always been allies of the US, and I would say even a very special relationship and all sorts of things, but they have strongly nationalist, chauvinist feelings, and will say it at every possible location that they are also happy to sometimes non-align, but they're still an alliance partner of the US. So I would like to get the, the, the trust feelings out of alliance decisions. I think a lot of it is also the, the dependence that you have. Great. I think what we're going to do is we're going to turn to the audience and start to take some some questions. Um, so I see this gentleman right here on the left, the blue sweatshirt. We'll start there. OK, um, good night and thank you. Uh, my name is Luis. I'm from Brazil. So um, a Brazilian researcher named uh, José Luis Fiori, he wrote a book talking, made in a metaphoric relation between the Babel Tower and the creation of the liberal and globaliza globalized world order by United States. So the same way that God created the what humans, the humans create the bubble tower, and this creates the dilemma and contradictions between the relation to God and the humans. Same way the United States create the, this liberal and multipolar world order, and now we are living uh, dilemmas. So, as a Brazilian, uh, I had a curiosity. I'm not from international relations area, so about the BRICS role in all this thing, because uh, I want to ask if the future of the world world order necessarily passed by the role of the dollar as a big stick of the United States in the world. Because this week, uh, Lula was united with the 10 presidents from South America talking about the creation of a new and unique uh, currency to um, make deals in, in Brazil and China, mm -hmm. make deals in his own. So I want to know about the BRICS role in these things. OK, thank you. Thank you okay. Very much. great. BRICS, the dollar, globalization. Uh, other hands? Ah, there. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Hi, my name is Anna. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I think if I was to answer the panel's first question, what are the most important issues of the time, um, for me would be uh, global poverty and climate change as well. Um, and I think, but maybe when I look, say for example, as our panel is an example, I see China, I see US, I see Germany, and me now as well, I'm British. Um, I think maybe there's missing voices at this table, and perhaps that's representative of how I feel about these 
um, international institutions at this time and we continue to listen and maybe give power to um, nations that have may maybe were maintaining a status quo and now we have kind of global uh, digital revolution and evolution we have a lot more opportunity to give more power back to the people um, in terms of us as the checks and balances to good governance kind of maybe through improved transparency of information through sort of online platforms where people can actually have better access to the conversations that are going on at a global level and um, I mean for, for me for example on those two issues I have a, a government that is still saying yes to new oil fields it's rejecting refugees and it's and it's not encouraging immigration and for me those things are not aligned with the transitions that we need to see if we are to have a sustainable or any future at all. And so maybe the role of these um, international institutions no longer needs to be to focus on the power dynamics and trade, but actually about empowering people within nations so that they can have more of a say on these global, but also in uniquely um, individual issues within each nation. Very good, good to have your question. Um, I'll, I'll pick you up in the second round. I'm going to go online right here. Yeah. Thanks. Just to say we have 75 people online in total, and we have people online in, from uh, the Barbados, Belgium, uh, Brazil, the US, Switzerland, Ecuador, Germany, Nigeria, Portugal, the United Arab Emirates, Chile, and Italy. And we have a question from online, which is, how can countries in the global north act in financial solidarity to the countries of the global south affected by climate change and economic uncertainty. Thank you. So, three interesting, different questions. Um, empowering people, using international institutions to empower people. You want Cornelia? I think that has you like written um, all over the bricks. Um, and um, Global North, Global South, the last question. Well, let's go ahead. Yeah. Why don't we start with Cornelia? Yes, and I'd like to uh, ask, answer the question. I, I agree with you that empowering people needs to be a very important part of the effort to know how to rethink institutions. I part ways when you mentioned digital technologies as a solution because I think that is the big letdown of all the hopes we had of what digital technologies would enable us to do. We thought because access is so easy, it is one way for people to express themselves and be part of a conversation. And what we realize now is that it is actually the root for so much distortion and such an uneven weight of what we're trying to understand now in the political debate that part of what we need to get in order in, order, in, in the democratic backsliding that we have may, may be to get hold of how these digital technologies function. I'll just cite one statistic, which I don't know the basis of, so take it or leave it, but it has impressed me when I heard it. 60% um, of the voices we hear on the internet and social media are not human voices. They're robots. So who do you listen to when you listen to the discussions that are going on online? And what does it do to our societies to include these voices? I think is one of the biggest challenges we have to solve. Um, and I think it's not the route to empowering people. But I am with you. We have to find a route. And we have to make sure that there are part of the discussion in a different way because we're, we're, um, we are playing with the entire legitimacy of the international order and we know that that's part of the big um, division, we had a discussion about this with Monica Hess this morning, of people in many countries who just say, go away with your global order. The solution to all the problems is with the national communities and nationalist tendencies and that's part of the problem that we're just discussing. So I didn't give you an answer, I made it more complicated, but I'm with you. <laughs> Roger. Look, I mean, I might have some kind of an unconventional view on BRICS. I think I would say BRICS has had its moment, notwithstanding all you hear about it. Uh, BRICS came out of a moment when there was fear of a unipolar moment in the 1990s, mm -hmm. when the US uh, seemed to run rampage around. So the Russians tried to put this together, besides uh, Goldman Sachs. <laughs> so you can say, look, from a purely market perspective. But I think today, I mean, for India at least, the contradiction, the principal contradiction is with China. It's not with the US. America is not sitting on my territory. China is, I mean, that's at least my perception, Indian perception. 
But China is bigger than all the others put together in the BRICS. India, Russia, Brazil, you know, South Africa put together with China's bigger economy. So the Chinese weight in the institution has grown. So, so while India might sit there, and in fact our foreign minister is right now in South Africa attending a meeting of the BRICS. So we will do the talk. But if you look at our structure of our international relations, what has changed in the last 20 years is my trade with the US is the biggest. I'm trying to reduce my trade with China. I don't have much of a trade with uh, Russia, which I'm trying to, you know, buy some oil uh, and sell it to the Europeans, to make some money. Uh, so that's, but the structure itself is the orientation has moved in another direction. The threats I face on territorially, in the region, in the multilateral domain, are with China. So then people would ask, why is the BRICS expanding? Why does everybody want to be part of the BRICS? I mean, I could say expand and perish. Uh, probably that's one way of thinking about it. I go back to the 1980s, when everyone and their uncle wanted to join the non-aligned movement. Even France said, great, great idea, let's join the non-aligned movement. But the fact is, it was over. By the end of 80s, the non-aligned movement was over. Mm -hmm. So I think if China had been generous to its neighbors, if China was a better economic partner, maybe you would have seen another point. But mm -hmm. today, I think uh, the BRICS will continue to do the talk. Anybody who has a resentment, Saudis will say, look, we'll come to the BRICS. But this talk about constructing an alternative order, we'll get our currency through a lot of that. As you said, look, it's just a long, long way off. So I'll tell my friend, see what they do. Don't go by the talk is cheap, that we're going to replace dollar tomorrow. But I think getting it done is one hell of a job. So, so I would say, uh, easy to underestimate, uh, overestimate BRICS. My sense is it has its own internal contradictions. And managing those itself uh, will become a challenge for many of us. Um, I think that I'm supposed to be saying what Raj is saying, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm not going to uh, to do that because I think I think he's he's got it wrong. Um, the big picture in my mind is the one that, that you laid out, Cornelia. If you, you know, it's too bad we don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but if you put up financial flows and lending and infrastructure investment and you did it over time, the, 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 the map would change in color. It's not just a little one here and a little one there. We have seen a fundamental shift in uh, in who is the dominant investor, trader, uh, lender in many parts of the world, and, and it's China. And I think that's gonna, that will have a big impact on how countries align themselves, uh, and it's going to create not a China-centric world, but a, a world in which countries are going to be hedging their bets, keeping their options open, not going either one way or the other way. And I think that's exactly what will happen with India. Um, you know, y you mentioned the BRICS, but it's not just the BRICS, it's, it's also the SCO. Uh, and I think the war in Ukraine is a, is a, is a very instructive moment. Right? This is an unabashed, unadorned invasion of Russia by its neighbor, an attempt to conquer it. Where's India? Sitting on the fence, uh, buying Russian gas, buying Russian weapons. Uh, and I won't say whether I think this is the right policy or the wrong policy, but this is this is a sense. This gives us a sense that India is going to navigate this complicated world in a way that is not decidedly Western or Eastern. It's going to be Indian. Uh, and I, and I, I, you know, I, I see you nodding your head. I'm guessing that Brazil is going to be doing exactly the same thing. One day they'll go this way, the next day they'll go that way, and that's because we're going to be living in a world that is multi-vector, and countries will be following their, their interests in a way that, that isn't going to be bimodal. I think we're coming off of a Cold War. You either went this way or that way. This era is going to be much more complicated than that. 
Charles, just to pick up on a small thing, I think you misspoke when you said it's an invasion of Russia by its neighbor. You meant to say an invasion of Ukraine by its neighbor. Am I correct? Uh, yes. yes. I think <laughs> you caught a, a misstatement. Actually, uh, can I, can yeah, I just um, um, say uh, certain things in response to Charlie and to, uh, to uh, Cornelia, which is that um, about this uh, trade dependence, right? Um, so just just I uh, just a little pushback on on that. Um, we know that the biggest investors, for example, I mean, well, China's a trading largest trading partner for a lot of countries and all of Southeast Asia. But um, in terms of investments, it is not. Uh, it's actually uh, the United States, the EU, and Japan have the largest investments in the region. Um, and it, there are studies that show that economic dependence or interdep interdependence does not necessarily lead to uh, having the same stand on security or policy, political issues. Um, some of them, uh, you know, there may be some alignment in terms of economy issues, but not necessarily political security sphere. And I give you just one example because mm -hmm. I have it right here. I've been working on this paper. So <laughs> this is the place. This is the moment. Yeah. So this is Russia's war in Ukraine. Yeah. And uh, you know, China has been unable to really corral a coherent response, uh, a, a same voting pattern, um, in um, from Southeast Asia countries. You see Singapore being the most not outspoken, right? We uh, we defended the principles of international law, uh, law and we actually unilaterally sanctioning Russia. Now, the rest of the region's governments have also not been united in their response. Uh, they did not unite behind China. Um, so, uh, there are, if I'm not wrong, there have been four resolutions so far. So, the record has been that, um, okay, the, the, only the Philippines and Myanmar uh, and the UN uh, Myanmar cities led by the NLD, the Democratic Party, whose seat is, uh, is uh, here, they have supported all four, so it's only the Philippines and Myanmar, they have supported all four resolutions against what China is doing. Uh, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore have voted yes on three, but abstain from the April 2022 resolution to suspend Russia from UN Human Rights uh, Council. Laos and Vietnam did the opposite, abstaining from three and voting no onto the April resolution. So you're actually looking at very mixed records. There's no alignment of what China would want from the region in terms of, of the voting record. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not so much about, uh, yes, I agree, trust is not the, the, thing, the thing, but economic dependence also does not necessarily lead to um, same uh, stands on political and security uh, issues. Right. Well, I mean, this would support your argument that it's multi-vector, mm. I suppose, yeah. right? Because that there's no consistent pattern. Hard, but but one wonders if one has to wait longer. I mean, this is we're talking a, a little a, a year and, uh, and and several months. I mean, so um, it's drawing a, a, a very large inference from granted a big event, but maybe. Maybe you uh, you know that that kind of variegated response, either with respect to China or aligning with the West, changes. I mean, I think that's what I took your position, Raja, to be that if if you wait, there's movement moving kind of towards the U.S. and the West in in Asia. No, that's what I'm, I'm not saying. See. India will be do, do it do its own thing, mm -hmm. but at this point, India's contradictions with China have brought it closer to the U.S. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So India is not going to be yeah. a member of NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not seeking an alliance with the Americans. Right. We are not asking the Americans to send troops uh, to the Himalayas. Nor is America is offering as an alliance. Right. So a loser coalitions. That's what I'm talking about. So it's not. Don't think of everything has to be in the NATO mold. That it has to be, they stand with you, they vote with you for everything that you want them to. Starting with Britain, I mean, then you count the rest and everyone simply just stands up with, behind the Americans. We're not going to do that. But yet, there will be enough convergence of interest mm. to, to work together. And the U.S. is not looking, in my view, more free riders, like some of our European friends. It wants people who will stand, take positions, generate capacities. And the U.S. is saying, look, we are willing to help Asian partners to build in situ balance of power. So I think you've got to break out of the NATO framework. That's the only way to operate. 
The U.S. would be primus inter pares, number one power overall in terms of comprehensive mm -hmm. capabilities. If it adopts a flexible approach to rising powers where it can work with them <laughs> on different coalitions, uh, then its capacity to play the game would be, would be stronger. Uh, and my sense is, while China has huge economic domination, uh, you've seen Sri Lankan case. I mean, the reluctance to actually mm -hmm. come in, step in and assist countries who have been so close to you, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So they're giving them some money. So I think it's not size of investment, you know, trade is not alone. The capacity to do the kind of things that the Western institutions have done to be able to respond to the economic crisis. That's what, but I'll just say one more thing. That today, whether it's Africa, Latin America, a whole lot of countries, as their markets open up to, for example, Africa, has a huge potential today, and my sense is to just simply lump them as single global south, the capacity both on the Indian Ocean side, on the Atlantic side, mm -hmm. to bargain with the two major powers has grown. So, so I would say think of them as active participants rather than this protesting trade union called the global yeah, south. Right. They and, have uh, we didn't, couldn't do it last time and I don't think we're doing it again this time. <laughs> we're going to take some more questions. I, I, back here, the guy in the blue, right? We'll go, yeah. I passed on you last time. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Bruno. I'm a PhD student here. Don't we sometimes exaggerate the level of coherence, the strength of the old Western-led international liberal order? It's not like before China came along with its loans, the IMF had a stellar trajectory in the global south <laughs> managing debt, right? If anything, we didn't get into more crisis because China was buying commodities and that lifted economies for a while in the global south. Same with peace and security. I think Frank Fukuyama the other day was just saying that, well, it's unheard of that a country would invade another, and they, they said, what about Iraq? And he said, oh, well, yeah. Uh, so don't we get this misplaced nostalgia for global governance that was never there in the first place? Uh, I, I wanted to ask you guys about it. Okay, thanks, Bruno. I'll take the woman down here in the green top, second row. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Anika. I'm a master's student in inequalities and social science here. Um, I'm curious to probe a point that was made about the restructuring of global financial systems um, and ask what you see as being incentives that would really encourage countries like the U.S. who are in a position of influence and power to adopt more radical reforms or reforms that sort of destabilize their position of power in the global political economy. And we'll take a guy over in the white t-shirt there, yeah, white shirt. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you, LSE, for organizing this event. I'm Chirayu Thakkar from uh, Next Door King's College doing PhD, and I work on multilateralism, global governance. My question is, uh, when we talk about China, I'm I'm asking the reverse of what the previous uh, question was, that there is a misplaced nostalgia for the, for the past. But my question is that how exactly is uh, China posing a threat to current global governance? And, and I'll go with a couple of concrete indicators because I work on multilateralism. Uh, now, a lot of times there was a reputation that if there was a PowerPoint presentation, maybe the colors are changing and uh, China is replacing as the most uh, trusted part, uh, I mean, traded partner, etc. But there is a genuine wariness for China as well. Uh, and and, and I'll, I'll take uh, two concrete examples. 18 months ago, uh, China tried very desperately to put elements of Xi Jinping talk into some of the UN resolutions and it was immediately scrubbed off. And who supported them? Of course, India was there, the US was there, but apart from that, it was countries from Africa and Latin America. Second, China is struggling to sell its J10 because there is a genuine realization. The third point uh, that, that, that I would like to say is that, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the top 25 economies, how many friends has China got? So how China can threaten with a handful of friends, maybe Saudi has showed some flexibility, Turkey is showing some flexibility, but with a Iran or, or a Cambodia, how can it be the real genuine threat? I mean, what has exactly China done? Are we overreacting to the threat, at least so far as the global governance, multilateralism, etc. is concerned, 
when it is not exactly winning trends. Okay, it can be a bully like what it did to Australia, but it gives a negative press. So the question is, how exactly is China a threat right now? Is China Pardon really me. 10 feet tall? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, good question. So uh, we've got, I think we'll go with these three questions. Cornelia, you have your hand up. I'll, I'll start with your question to give an answer to the other two, and I'll try to be quick. I don't think China is a threat. I think China has to be part of the solution. And I'm really coming at this at, from the, the global governance part. I don't have nostalgia. I just think the problems we have today are global problems. We cannot solve climate change by ourselves. We cannot prevent global pandemics by ourselves. We cannot um, have even security by ourselves. So yes, I am nostalgic of a world that has never existed where we get together and try to solve global problems and that does require some form of multilateral order. And the one we have in place, yes, has not worked very well in the past, and I won't even go into the details, but even in the past it was designed maybe by misunderstanding and upon an accident by a country that was trying to um, use its own interests to solve the, the stakes after World War II, the US, um, and every multilateral system is always the uh, reflection of power relations at the time. The only thing I'm saying is now this old order doesn't correspond even at the basic level to the power relations we currently have. So we are going from a dysfunctional system to one that may be nearing death. I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but I'll just get, like to get my point across. I did my PhD on the WTO. And at the time, I was working on service trade agreements, and everyone was saying WTO is eternally in crisis, but then they get over it. Ever since my PhD, and I'm old now, <laughs> the WTO has not gotten out of its crisis. And I think that is, should get us really worried. What are the organizations we can create that are actually able to solve the challenges for global governance, which we all know and which we cannot do ourselves? So I do think it's important that the multilateral order we're imagining reflects the different voices that need to be part of it. Raja, we'll just come right down the line. Yes. No, I would say, I mean, look, I think it's, one is on the political side, but if you look at on the other side, I mean, the whole question of Chinese capitalism, how it has operated, that the rise of the Chinese capital, whether it's through Belt and Road Initiative or the kind of trade policies that they've, they've initiated, that is what has triggered the counter moves in the United States that what it has done to the American economy internally, the argument is at three levels, what happens to American workers, what's happening to American technological dominance, and finally on the Asian question, uh, Chinese are saying, look, you know, there's a saying, I think old Mao Zedong once said, uh, Chinese Americans are snoring next to my bed. I'm talking about 1950s, a Kumai Matsu crisis. He says, right now I can't push them out, uh, but someday I'm going to tell them, sir, you're disturbing me, would you like to leave? Uh, that is the capabilities they're building today to push the Americans out of Asia. It is that the idea that you have this intent that was good enough to galvanize the U.S. In six years, starting with the Trump administration, the U.S. policies have profoundly changed. Wall Street is still behind, but the rest of Washington and others see if we don't deal with the China challenge today, it's going to get even worse. Initially, Silicon Valley too was with Wall Street saying we love China, we make more money, maybe Tesla is still doing that. But in Washington, there is a new consensus that China poses a fundamental problem to American society, American technological leadership, and it is beginning to galvanize the rest of it. And that's where we are. I mean, it is not that China is going to take over the world tomorrow. Uh, if maybe 10 years down the road, they could have done it. But I think today, it's their activity has produced a backlash. Because otherwise, they had everything going for them. They were part of the system, they were benefiting from the interaction with the West. But I think what Deng Xiaoping, what and his immediate successor did, I think Xi Jinping has reversed those policies. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what if you show your intent, others are going to react, and I think that's what that's what has happened. Chirayu is uh, my former TA. Yeah. <laughs> ah, you have a ringer on the audience. Okay. Yeah, so he was uh, he's my uh, former TA. Um, in NUS, um, in Equal News School. So, um, you know, I, I, okay, so the region sees China not as a threat, but as economic benefiter. Um, Southeast Asia, I don't know, but India. India is different. I mean, the only threat that comes is uh, insecurity policies, right? Uh, that's related to um, 
the, what's happening in the South China Sea dispute. So for claimant states, China is a threat in a sense. Uh, Philippines, Vietnam, um, largely the ones. Malaysia too, a bit of pushback, but not as worried as the Philippines and the Vietnamese. So here we are talking about dyadic kind of uh, bilateral kind of threats, right? You're asking about global governance. China is, I agree with Cornelia, which is that China has to be part of the solution. China is not a threat per se. But, but having said that, um, when it comes to rule settings in some of these global governance networks, uh, these global governance uh, rules uh, related to, say, digital economy, uh, CPTPP, all these trade organizations, the worry is that China has a different set of rules for the economy, but does it necessarily promote, the, it, it does, is it concurrent with the kind of rules that the rest of us want to promote? I think that's a big question. And we are, uh, we, it's not clear right now. So the threat is only in, 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 in global governance, it's in the kind of rule setting that's happening. Are they in accordance to the kind of rules that we want? Because the, the Chinese system is quite different, right? So that's short answer. Yeah, I would, I would call the, the sense of, of China posing a threat as, as more theological than it is practical in the sense that uh, I agree with Selena that China right now is, is largely interested in a geopolitical sense in flexing its muscles in its region. And it would like the United States to move out so that it enjoys what it would consider to be sway in its, in its neighborhood. Uh, but you know, outside that, that sphere, I, I don't think one can talk about a, a threat if that means a kind of um, imminent military threat. But I do think that you know, we, we are headed into a world in which probably in about 10 years, China will have the world's largest economy, and it will probably, over the next several decades, significantly surpass the United States. And we know from history, when something like that happens, it, it changes the world. And so the idea that that development can take place without a fundamental revision in how we think about global governance and geopolitics, that strikes me as fanciful. Right? Th this is a development that is going to change the world, particularly because China is, is not a democracy and there will be ideological tension. But I land in the same place that, that Cornelia does, which is that we cannot allow the relationship with China to descend into a new Cold War. Mm -hmm. Because going back to a geopolitically fractured landscape we would deny the kinds of uh, pragmatic efforts to tackle climate and poverty and pandemics and the global financial architecture. So we, we just can't afford to go down that road. It is, however, the road that we are going down right now at high speed, and that's dangerous. We've got time for another round of questions. I'm going to start over here, the guy in the, and I'll come back to this <clears throat> Well, thank you very much. My name is Adam. I'm a double degree student with Columbia and here at LSE in a, in a Master of Public Administration. Um, my question is more specifically going to um, Cornelia's point, talking about obviously the benefits of having a, a, a true democratic government and how that obviously uh, in, in its own right has uh, a different degree of effectiveness of, of public policy. My question, I think, is if you look at China, India, and Russia, you have one thing the last 10 years which is consistent is that their leader hasn't changed. In China, it looks like it won't change for, for the immediate future. In Russia, it doesn't seem like it's going to change anytime soon unless there's some sort of form of intervention. And in India, for example, it looks like Modi is going to stay. He has to fight an election, though. He has to fight an election, but it would, it would seem that he, he presumably will win the next election. Does this sort of continuity of government and predictability of leadership in these countries, if anything, ironically, um, actually ensure that, obviously, there isn't this fracture because there's this element of predictability with leaders? So I guess that's my question. Is, is there a sort of an, uh, 
a silver lining to having these sort of auto, almost autocratic leaders in certain certain states uh, to ensuring continu continuity and how to deal with governance. Chris, I'll take a question online and then I'll come to the back there. One sec. Thank you. This online question comes from Anthony Vallion, who's an LSE external alum, who asks, how does Europe fit in? It's a leader on climate and still pulls in immigrants, but has NATO expansion helped or hindered Europe being a pole in a multipolar order? Thank you. Gentleman back there with the black shirt on. And I'll come over and take one more. Hello, um, my name is uh, Jim Wojin. I'm a research fellow at uh, Institute for Security and Development Policy in Stockholm, uh, ISDP. Uh, I have a quick question for Selena. Um, uh, my former boss at LKY School. RA. This one is RA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, or, or the whole panel. Yeah, anyway. Um, so you mentioned that Asia, or in particular Southeast Asia, uh, wants diversity. And uh, in your assessment, how well has ASEAN as a whole uh, navigated between China's BRI and the uh, uh, US uh, Indo Pacific strategy, these two competing initiatives in the region? Thank you. I'm going to take one question. There was a woman right in front of you. You had your hand up. You do. Yeah. Yeah. My name is uh, Anne. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, but uh, I'm sitting wondering why we don't mention Russia in this. I mean, it has to go with the global governance, and of course they don't have the power. But I really think they are part of what is happening in the world, and I would like you to comment on that. Okay, who would like to start? I think we're going to be rounding it out. We only have a few minutes here, so I would ask everybody to use this as an up one last bite at the apple. You have about a minute each. Charlie, you want to I'm start? I'm still thinking, You're so still start thinking. with someone else. So, has somebody thought already? I, okay. <laughs> okay, Selena, no. Selena, go ahead. No. Go ahead. Oh, okay, because my, my question, your question is, I, I think I can answer quite quickly. You so had, how, this was a planted uh, question. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> None of these are planted. But uh, your question was how is Southeast Asia navigating between IPEF and BRI, right? I think that we all loved it. We all love the fact that we have choices here, the IPEF and the BRI, um, which is actually, I mean, we are, uh, most of us, I'm not trying to recall now, no, we all signed on to the BRI. Seven out of the 14 countries in IPEF are Southeast Asian countries. So that's an interesting thing. So you can see that the, the, the region doesn't make these alignment choices. They just go for maximum options. Um, there is no, you know, um, a Chinese sphere of influence in Southeast Asia. We go to whichever organization that gives us the most leverage. And, you know, even IPF is not, is still nebulous in many ways, but it's welcome in the region. Both are welcome, more the merrier. Cornelia. I have two quick answers. I think one is a little bit confused, but I would like to answer your question about um, what good is liberal democracy if clearly, uh, if you have stability in leadership, um, all, it's not the way you asked it, but autocratic systems can sometimes do much better, which is the discussion that a lot of countries are now having. And, um, and I would just like to say that this is similar to the trade-off that I alluded to in speaking about Germany. Um, and then I'm not attached to democracy, I'm attached to liberal democracy, which is not just the fact that you have popular votes and a change of government, but you also have the protection of minority rights and you have a rights-based idea behind the entire political system. And I think um, that system, yes, comes at a trade-off. If you do it, no matter how you do it, um, you lose state capacity. You lose the capacity to just pull through with whatever idea your leader has. But the, the challenge is that the state capacity you can get with strong leadership or state leadership is that you you can hope for a benevolent leader, but if you don't get it, then you're just down in a, in a bad space. And, and that's why I think it's important to defend liberal democracy, not because they're better at doing things. They're not good at building infrastructure. They're not good at lancing, doing reform, and they're not good at strategizing. It, that's the cost of, I think, this, uh, this entire structure. Let me answer also to where's Europe in all of this? Um, Europe has identified the only way they can be anywhere is if they do it together. 
because this is uh, this is obviously in a world where you have yes, you're right to remind us Russia, you have China, you have the U.S., you have other countries. Mm -hmm. You're nobody's going to care for Luxembourg's opinion. Nobody might even care for Germany's opinion if it is not the entire continent somehow building together. And again, now we have the challenge in order for Europe to be there. Macron was giving a speech just yesterday saying thank you to the U.S., thank you to NATO, but we have to have defense capacities on ourselves. So I'm pleading for a European defense. Uh, that we have to invest in. Sure, in 2045, where was the world in 2045 that you just designed? That's going to be very late. So Europe is not exactly in a good space. Somebody called us the vassal of uh, the US. Uh, uh, I think we, we can positively say we have identified that the only way for Europe to survive in this, this world is if we stick together. And we have a whole lot of more complicated institutional questions to deal with before we get there. Raja, one minute. Yeah, I, mean, I would say, you know, on Europe, I mean, we love to see Europe uh, become a real <laughs> geopolitical actor <laughs> because I think the more the merrier. Because I think for us, a Europe that is weak on the western edge of the Eurasian continent is a problem. But a Europe that is actually strong can produce a reasonable balance in Europe and contribute to Asian security. That's the Europe we want, but we're not there. I think that is part of the problem, that Europe is internally divided. Uh, it's not willing to spend money on defense uh, because it's built such wonderful welfare states. Uh, so I think there is a problem, and I don't see Europe becoming a geopolitical actor anytime soon. And I think they'll be, and, and in a way, the Ukraine crisis has demonstrated they can't defend themselves and actually ceded ground to the United States to come back in and to play a, a much larger role. Uh, in, the, in the European continent. And that brings me to the Russian question. I mean, ideally, Russia should be integrated. You tried it in G7, it was at one point G8. It didn't work. The arrangements that were made in 1991, the idea that Russia can be integrated into European, common European home, that broke down. There's no agreement on what the understandings were, whether those understandings have uh, you know, been implemented or not. So I think you are at a crisis in Europe. I mean, who would have thought after two world wars, after the Cold War, it is Europe still where it has to sort out its internal arrangements. And Macron keeps talking about bringing Russia is must be part of Europe. Mm -hmm. Without integrating Russia, there will never be peace. But then, at this point, the terms of those rapprochements are not visible. I think in terms of what Russia demands and what Europe is willing to give, I don't see how that's going to be fixed. Charlie? Uh, two final comments. One is, is simply to say that, picking up on a point Selena made, I think the regional groupings are going to be increasingly important. You, you spoke about ASEAN. I don't think ASEAN will be alone. I think we'll see in this kind of multi-vector world that regions are going to band together more regularly because it, it, it gives them the kind of weight that they need in, uh, in the world where the, you have countries like China and, and, um, and India and the United States, large economies of scale. Uh, final uh, comment would be on, on Russia. Um, Russia has made a big boo-boo uh, by invading uh, Ukraine. It's going to be paying for that boo-boo for a, a very long time to come. Uh, this is not a war that uh, is, is going to end in a way that, that at least outside Russia will be seen as in any way a, a strategic gain for the country. That having been said, I do think that the United States, the UK, its partners should try to end this war sooner rather than later. Yes, let's give this offensive that's about to start a chance. But I do think that come the end of this offensive this year, it will be time to try to pivot the parties from the battlefield to the negotiating table, even if that means for the time being living with a Ukraine that is not in full control of its territorial sovereignty. But this is a war that is polarizing the international system it's pushing Russia and China closer together. It's causing food shortages and energy shortages and inflation globally. It's forcing President Biden to spend his day figuring out whether to transfer F-16s to Ukraine 
rather than getting broadband internet into the American heartland, which in my mind is a much more important task. So let's try to end this war sooner rather than later so that we can get back to the agenda that we've been discussing here tonight, which is how to get the powers and the little powers and the middle powers of the world to come together to address what are incredibly pressing transnational challenges that can only be addressed through broad international cooperation across ideological dividing lines. We are going to leave it there. We're in overtime <coughs> as it is. Cornelia, Raja, Selena, Charlie, thank you for just a terrific discussion. Thanks all of you for being